If you're ready for the word this morning, somebody shout, oh yeah. All right, I want to show you an interesting thing this morning. And I want you, if you will, if you feel comfortable, stand for reading of God's word in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. They make you rise when you enter a courtroom. So I think we can stand for the reading of God's word. I know it's hard once you got settled. And, uh, but I do appreciate it. Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. And it reads like this. Although I am the less of the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles and the boundless riches of Christ. And look at this. To make plain to everyone the, admin, sorry, the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was now through the church that the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm talking to you, I thought this morning, simply entitled The Mysterious Purpose. The Mysterious Purpose, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Do me a favor, stretch your hand this way. Let's pray that God would anoint the word this morning. Father, we love you and thank you today, Father. We know that it's your word that never comes back void. And I pray today, God, Lord, that you would just help me, Father, to flow in your spirit. Father, that's all I want. God, you know my heart for you. You know I'm a zealous person for you. You know I'm a passionate about you. But God, let me flow in your spirit today. That's what I ask, that my words would not be my own, but they would be yours to minister to the hearts of those that are in this congregation today. Father, we love you and we praise you. And all God's children said, amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. In one of my last sermons, I talked to you, I believe it was a couple weeks ago, about the mysteries of God, how there are deep mysteries in the Word of God. There are things that God wants to communicate to us and that God wants to communicate through us. I, I spoke to you how God's desire is to find someone to show these great things to. Well, last week, while I was praying and reading my Bible at my home, uh, just doing my daily devotion, I came across this scripture that I've probably read 12 or 13 times. And God just kind of jumped some things out at me that I want to share with you. It's just going to be plain and simple. I'm just going to share a few little dots with you, I believe. But it was something that was powerful because, it, like I said, Ephesians is a book that I've read a bunch. And the fact that I've gotten past it this many times and never seen it shows you the depths of the mysteries of God. That I'll let you know. The mysteries are God of God are there. It's just whether or not we have the scales on our eyes. That Paul spoke about this, and let the scales fall from my eyes that I might see your truth. We, we have to understand that there are things for us to see. The question is, are we tuned in enough to see them? You see, uh, here, here's what's interesting when it comes about this mystery, if you will. Paul refers to it himself in the scripture as a mystery of God. He said, not only is it a mystery of God, but it's a mystery of God kept since the beginning of time. And he said it felt like it was his job to show and to preach and to teach that ministry. Now, however, before we get too deep into our sermon, I do want to show you something, and I want to remind you of who God gave this mystery to. Can I do that for just a second? Notice how Paul opens up this revelation. Let's look at, at verses 8 and 9. Although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry. I want you to look at how Paul refers to himself. He refers to himself as the least of the least of all the Lord's people. Now, somebody might think that Paul was being modest, but Paul wasn't being modest. Paul felt this way. Can I just stop here for a, remi a moment and remind you that Paul's name is not Paul. Paul's name is Saul. This is a man who changed his name because of what his past had accomplished. His name was Saul, but he said, I can't go by Saul because too many people have a negative connotation with that name. So just call me Paul. He was a man that, when we first meet him, is standing at the feet, I mean, sorry, is standing at the death of Stephen, a godly saint who was stoned to death. He was a man that went around with warrants, persecuting and putting to death the early Christian church. In fact, let's go a step further. How many times in Scripture do we see a moment 
where Paul can't get along with those he's preaching with and they got to split up. I mean, if you ever notice, you got Barnabas, you got Silas, I mean, you got Timothy. He's got all kinds of partners. At one point, he says in Scripture, me and this guy couldn't get along, so we went a couple of totally different directions. We see this. This is not a heartfelt statement. This is something. But Paul stands and says, I am the least of the least, and yet God has given me this revelation. See, we sit here today and I preach to people who feel about this big. To feel that God can't use you because you're not a Moses. You're not a Paul. You're not a David. I got people all the time says, I don't feel like I'm good enough for the goodness of God. Well, let me just put that to the rest. Honey, you're not good enough for the goodness of God. And neither am I. And that's why it's called grace. And that's why it's called mercy. There's nothing that you can do that can bring about the gift of salvation in your life. It was freely given. It was freely given to us. And that's what I want to share with you today. You might be here and you might feel like Paul. You might feel like you're the least of the least and there's nothing that you can do. It was this person that God gave his revelation to. So my question to you is today is, what are the reasons that you have that why God can't use you? Can I just tell you God is only looking for someone who says, God, I know. No, I'm not much. I know what I have is very little, but what little I have, God, I am going to give to you. If you're thankful for that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> See, I have people all the time that says, I feel like I'm not good enough. I feel like God won't do this for me. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like. And my greatest challenge is to get across to the people of God that feelings have nothing to do with it. I, some of my greatest challenges, counseling married couples, is sometimes I don't feel like I'm in love. Stop going off of feeling so very much. There are some days I feel like the world's flat. That don't mean it's flat. So does he. Some days you wake up at 4 a.m., you stub your toe, you're not going to feel saved. It's not about how I feel. It's about what I know. And that's what Paul said. I might be the least, and I might not be no good. There might be times he didn't even make a point. I wrote this with my own hands. I've got ailments. There were three, there was three times I asked God to take this problem away from him, and he didn't do it. But I will still tell you that God is faithful because when I sought him, he answered me. When I ran after him, he revealed to me. And now it is my job to preach to you the goodness and the grace of Almighty God. Feelings does not have anything to do with it. So let's look real quick. I want to show you some things, okay? Let's look at verse 10. It says, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be known. He said, it was now. And that's just something that spoke to me in my spirit. It was now. Will somebody say now? now. It was now. See, there's two things I want to show you about real quick. I said, first of all, when it comes to this, is what is the purpose of saying his intent was now? He makes a point to say now. So you have to understand that, that God has a perfect timing. And sometimes we feel like God's doing nothing. Matter of fact, sometimes we feel like Joseph rotting away in prison. We feel like nothing's going on. We feel like nothing's taking place. But we have to understand that God has a timing. Paul spoke and said that this was a mystery that had been kept secret since the beginning of time. But now is the time. See, just because God hasn't done something in the past doesn't mean he's not about to do it in the future. Just because he hadn't answered it yet doesn't mean he's not about to answer it tomorrow. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you've been living in one of these moments. But Paul makes an effort to say the time is changing. The time is now. It was one way yesterday, but it's about to be a new way today. You didn't understand it yesterday, but you're about to understand it today. Yesterday, things weren't going our way, but today is going to be a new day. I don't know who I'm talking to in the power of the Holy Ghost, but I want somebody to hear what the Lord has put on my heart to tell somebody today. The time is now. The season 
of now is here. There's going to be a change. There's going to be a moment when it flips, and that moment is now. I was sick yesterday, but now is a different story. I was going through difficulty yesterday, but now is a different story. He's making a purpose to tell somebody your season is about to change. He wants someone to know just because it was one way one day doesn't mean it's going to be that way tomorrow. And so just because it's been difficult for you yesterday, don't keep carrying your cross. Don't put it down. Keep carrying carrying your cross, keep fighting, keep believing, because there is a now in your life when the switch will flip. What is the purpose of saying now? Because it's about to change. I want to tell you something. That's what Christianity is about. It's about transformation. It's about metamorphosis. You used to be one way, but God changed you into another. It's like the seasons of this world. It used to be cold outside, but something changed and now it's warm. There used to be no leaves on the tree, but now something's changed and there's fruit on the branches. There used to be difficulty, but now something's changed. If you try to live in the past, your past will convince you that's all you're ever going to be. But hear me in the power of God. There is a now coming in your life. There's going to be a change where all things passed away and all things become new. Brother Donnie, I was addicted to this substance and I'm still struggling, but there's a now in your life. Brother Donnie, me and my wife have been fighting for three or four months. Hear me when I tell you there's a now in your life. Brother Donnie, it seems like I've been fought on my job. I've been struggling fighting. Financially, I've been going through a dark time in my life. Hear me when I tell you, Paul wants you to know there is a now in your life where things will turn on a dime, where things will turn upside down, and you will see that God is still in control. Come on if you're with me and bless the Lord in this house. The second thing I might want to say is, what is the power of seeing his attempt is now? This is what I love. See, this is what I want you to see about God. What is the, what, what, why, why now? What is the power of saying now, friend? Right now is when things are going to change. What, what is the power of that? Because right now things aren't going good for the home team. I, I want you to understand the time Paul is preaching this. First of all, he himself is in chains. He himself, as he's writing this, is in chains. Now's the time in which they're crucifying Christians. They'd already killed uh, James, put him to death. He's one of the big 12. He's done, been murdered and put down. This is the climate that's seeing people feed Christians to lions. And so if you ask the believer, they might be saying, things aren't going good for me right now. They're wanting to feed us to lions. Our, one of our main leaders are in chains. We're going through difficulty. We're going through problems. We're going through circumstances. It's one thing after another. But Paul says, it's right now right in the season. So I don't know who I'm talking to today that maybe that's you. You feel like you're in chains in life. You're being weighted down, that there's difficulty surrounding you. Right there, Paul says, even now, God has a purpose. I like saying it this way. All the pain that they were going through couldn't stop God's purpose in their life. Just because you have pain doesn't mean you don't have purpose. And right now, you might be coated in chains. Right now, there might be lions waiting to devour you. Right now, there might be difficulty surrounding you. I just want to tell you in the power of the Holy Spirit this morning that just because there's pain does not mean that there's not purpose. Paul says, even now, even now the lions are wanting to eat. Even now, while they're crucifying us, even now, there's about to be a change and you're about to see the wisdom of Almighty God. He turned out to be true, by the way, because the nation that was crucifying believers, the nations that were feeding them to lions would come to become the first nation that was radically changed by Christianity to the point that their kingdom came crashing down. I want you to know it doesn't matter about your chains. It doesn't matter about what your lions has to say. It matters that God is saying now, right now, there's something coming your way. So let's look real quickly today at three things. Three things to notice about God's intent, and this is very interesting. Number one, I want to notice who God is showing his wisdom to. So th that's that scripture in verse 10. It tells us, it says, his intent was now that he is going to show us his wisdom. Here's my thing. When I, I want you to look at me for a second. When you think about this, and you think about the wisdom of God, wouldn't you believe that he, who, who would you believe he was wanting to show his wisdom to? This is what really connected with me. I would think it would be Christians. I would think 
it would be the body of believers. Anybody else would be along that line of thinking? Let me see your hands. You would think that that's who God was wanting to show his wisdom to. Here's where the mystery comes in. That's not it. It's about to be interesting. You're about to see the the purpose of the church. You're about to see the purpose of God's plan. It's very interesting. I found it interesting. He wasn't showing his wisdom to the church. Look again. His intent, go, uh, go back one, please. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Man, this just gives me a little glimpse about God's personality, and I really like this part. I don't know why it speaks to me, but it does. It speaks to the fact, he says, he is showing the authorities in the heavenly realms. Now, what you need to understand is this is referring to angels. Not only the good angels, but those that are fallen. Now, here's something you're not going to hear preached in any of these crystal cathedrals today, and these we want to make you feel better. Here's an ice cream cone at the altar. Come on, I'll pat you on the head. Here's your free coupon for a t-shirt on the way out the door type churches. But you need to hear this, okay? There are rulers. And look at these words, authorities. You understand that word, authorities? We use that word with policemen. Because if you don't do what they say, they're going to lock you up. They have the authority to put me in jail. Authorities. Now, this is what you need to understand. Is that there are high things in the heavenly realms. We preached about this about six, eight months ago in a a different way. But I want to show you again. There's high things. Ephesians says it like this. Ephesians, I believe, is two and two says this, you once walked according to the course of this world, talking about when you was a sinner, according to the prince of the power of the air. Anybody have an idea who that's referring to? Satan. Now what does he call him? The prince of the power of the air. You believe that there's devils and demons in hell. There might well be. I don't believe that they are there yet. It's possible. Maybe that's why they're always scared of Jesus. Not 100%, but I will tell you this. I do know that they're set up in high places all across this country. Think about it like this. I can name you a city like Las Vegas, and your mind immediately goes to a sin. I can name you about four other cities, and immediately you can think of a sin. And that's because there are high places that are set up. See, Ephesians talks about this again in the next, uh, next little bit, it's 6 and 12. It says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, what do we do? Against principalities. Powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Notice this. We're wrestling against spiritual hosts of weaknesses in the heavenly places. See, maybe the reason why there's a problem in your life or in the life of someone you know is because there's a high thing set up in their life. There's a high thing set up. But this is what happens in this scripture. God says, I am about to show these high things who God really is. That there were high things set up. There were high things. And he says, I'm going to show you and I'm going to remind you that I'm still God. That they're lifted up right now across this world. There are demonic forces in high places. And yet God says from the beginning, the eternal purpose was to show them that he is still God. Satan may have made man low, but God was going to show him he was still God. See, can I tell you something? Satan is only a mimicker, but only God is a creator. And he thought he could bring, by bringing man low, there was nothing else that could be done, but he forgot. Although he don't have the power to create, God had the power to create. And he created a way out for us. And I just want to tell you something. Isn't it good to know that all these high things are sitting up here saying and boasting? You're acting like you don't think this is scripture. Do you remember the story of Job? The devil was boasting, and the devil said, he'll crumble, he'll do this. And God says, let me show you, I'm still God. See, what I want to stop here and tell you today is, God is looking for a reason in your life to show you he's God. He's still looking. He wants to show somebody he is God. When these high forces, when this sickness, when this problem, he wants to show them he's still God. So maybe the reason why you're sick right now is so that God can show sickness he is still God. Maybe the reason why you've got a need is so he can still show you he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is still showing up to show people that he can still show out and still be God. He wants to prove to people I am who I said I am. I am who the angels are singing about. I am that very one 
that the seraphim have to cover their face on because I am able to show you that I am powerful. I must have missed you all on that, right? I think I've missed you. So I'm going to go back and re-preach it, I think, because I think I've dropped the ball on this. I, I, I don't... God wants to show in your opportunity. That's what he's about. Isn't that what scripture says? I tell you all the time, he's looking for someone to show himself strong. On this, he was saying, I'm going to remind you. Hmm, let me put it this way. If you own a business and a third year employee say, we're leaving and we're going to form our own company and we're going to run you out of business. Many of us start chewing our own nails. What if your number two leaves you I mean, if a third of you got up and left right now, I'd be sweating bullets. If Pastor Jonathan got up, I don't think he'd do that. He better not. I'd bop him in the nose. <laughs> got up and said, I don't like this big guy on stage. He keeps us past 12. Come to me and I will labor all you those who are labored. I will give you rest and I'll have you out by 1140. And a third of you got up and went and formed a church. I'd be going crazy. Anybody else? No, okay. Let's say a third of your bank account got gave away to somebody else. Can I speak somebody's language this morning? <laughs> they called you, hey, I know a third of your retirement, gone. We're going to go crazy. But yet, when Lucifer stood up and took a third of his angels and formed his own kingdom, God wasn't getting weary. God wasn't getting nervous. God said, that's okay, I'll show you I'm still God. Jesus said, that's okay, I'll get off the cross and I'll, I'll get off the throne and I'll show them that I'm still God. I just want you to know that right now you think you might be rocked by a problem. You might be rocked by a debt. You might be rocked by a circumstance, but there's somebody in heaven that does not get rattled, that does not get rocked, It's not intimidated by cancer, who does not get worked over by fear, who will stand up and say there wasn't a such thing as light, and I said, let there be light, and and it came to pass. You tell me I'm scared of a power bill? Come on, somebody. You need to walk out of this building knowing my God is able. Somebody needs to walk out of this building declaring, I know that my God can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that I can ask or think. <laughs> Lucifer said, we out. God said two things. First of all, y'all were down in the earth in the blink of an eye. He didn't even bother getting He got so worried. He didn't even say, Michael, Gabriel. He said, in a flash of an eye, Jesus said, I saw him cast down. I saw him made lay low. But then he said, now watch this. Ooh, I felt the Holy Ghost on that. I'm not in my notes. God's got something for somebody. He's about to tell you, now watch this. They got me at a Red Sea. Now watch this. They about to throw me in the lion's den. Now watch this. They done made this fiery furnace seven times hotter, and they want to toss now watch this. Oh, he's going to change the world. He got nothing but zealots, fishermen, and rejects. And Jesus said, now watch this. And the devil said, oh, we got him right where we want him. We've taken him off the cross and we put him in the tomb. But three days later, Jesus said, now watch this. I, I don't know who I'm talking to in your life, but there's a now watch this. I'm on the unemployment line, but now watch this. My body is a little bit sick. But now watch this. My marriage is on the rocks. But now watch this. That's the God that you serve. Come on and bless the Lord in this house. So, so let's go real quickly to point number two. Now this is interesting. Notice who God uses to show his wisdom. We know who he's shown his wisdom to. But now let's see who he's using. And let's go again to verse 10. To our bread and butter today. His intent was that now. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Through the church. You want to know the church's purpose? It's this. There's a evil and good battle going on. And our job is to show the evil that God is still in control. That is the purpose. The purpose. See, I find it interesting. That all this, he said, I'm going to use this to show God. I like saying it this way. God want his, wants to use me to show them. Mm, mm, mm. I, somebody needs to write that down on the top of your paper. It might not be for everybody. 
but somebody needs to write it at the top of the paper and put a star by it. God wants to use me to show them. The reason why things are going bad right now is because God wants to use me to show them. The reason why I'm struggling so hard now is because God's going to use me. That don't sound very right. You know what the problem with this is? Is that you got too much of this propaganda of this everybody gets the trophy socialistic junk in our heads that God wouldn't do that thing to us. But honey, is that not what God's been doing since the beginning? You need to understand God is not a democracy. He's a monarchy. He does as he sees fit. Joe went through difficulty not because he did something wrong, but because he did something right. He made the children of Israel go through slavery so that he could say to Pharaoh, and I'm about to show the whole world I am God. I need you to understand that your God, sometimes God uses me to show them. Oh, we got, you're not going through heartache because you did something wrong. You're going through heartache because God's about to do something right. How did you get through? What book was you reading? What counselor did you see? What program was you going through? Tell me how you managed it. Who helped you rub your nickels together? And you could say, honey, I don't know what I did. I just stumbled into this thing. Because I'll tell you, it was God that brought me through. Let, I'm glad you brought that up. You want to hear my business model? Let me show you to you real quick. I'm glad you brought it up. How did I get through those tear-filled nights? How did I get through those sick days? How did I get through those moments? I'll tell you how. Because there was a God who sought me through. There was a Savior who stood closer than a brother. There was a God who ordered my steps, and there was a God who lit my path. I just want you to know, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you about the goodness and the power of Almighty God. Anybody willing to say, God used me to show them? Some nurses are only going to see God's glory when they see you having faith in that hotel room. Some accountants are only going to see God's glory when he gives you the bad news and you go, that's okay, my God's got this. Your neighbor is only going to see God's glory when you go through the darkest hour of your life and yet you have no fear because God has been with you. Sometimes God uses me to show them. Now here's what's interesting. Here's what God... Uh, in this, we see a purpose. We have a purpose. We, we, we have a purpose. Jonathan, can I borrow you for just a second? Okay, Jonathan, if you don't mind, you're, you're going to be these high things. Can you, you stand up here? And, and so what we do is we have forgotten that the church has a purpose. And this is something that struck me. Because you know what the church does today? And I can speak for the American church. We're really busy. Because this is what happens. We're all about needs. Meeting needs. And I don't know what that says about the American Christian. I'll let you do the math. I believe I'll just go and fill it in. Because some of you are looking at me like, yeah, I just get riled up and tell you. We're too selfish and self-centered. It's all about me that we got to find a church that meets my need instead of following in line and letting God use me to meet someone else's need. Y'all's quietness is getting me wanting to preach a little bit because that means I'm on your toes and I'm getting excited. I want to stomp a little. Come on, somebody. We get to the point, but let's say this enemy comes over here and creates a fire. And then he goes over there and creates a fire. We, we're like, let's meet this need. Let's go over here. And he goes and he creates another one. And then we go right here. Excuse me, evil guy. And we put out this fire. Let's meet this need. Let's meet with this family. Let's, let's, let's work together to solve this hunger crisis. And we, we're dealing with these issues that he's created at place after place. And we're all about meeting a need. And in doing so, we have not been meeting our purpose. God says, I'm going to show you high things that I am God by my church. Our purpose is to clash with the high things. We've been dealing with the repercussions of the high things. We just haven't been dealing with the high things. Can't do that when you're having a kumbaya gospel. I can guarantee you today... There ain't a lot about telling some congregations, hey, there's a devil out wanting to kill you. There's a high thing set up in your life. And the other way you're going to get to get it is by getting on your knees and fasting and dealing with it. I guarantee you it's instead, don't you worry, gumdrops are going to come and everything's going to work out. There ain't no bad things after you. 
But can I remind you, church, we got a purpose. And we've confused purpose, our purpose for meeting people's needs. But we can meet every need in this community, and that doesn't change the fact that there's a spiritual hold on their hearts and in their lives and in their souls. But I remember what 2 Corinthians told me. He said, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But what are they? They're mighty in God. For what? You can't, if to pull something down, it had to be up. Our purpose is, it's great to meet needs, and we're supposed to be doing that. But our purpose is not to be dealing with the fires that's been set. It's to deal with the one who set the fires. That's okay. I know what I'm preaching today. I'm just telling you right now. We want to deal with it. Oh, there's a problem. Let's deal with it. Oh, Tommy's doing bad again. Well, let's deal with Tommy. It's time for the church to wake up and God's intentions for us was to clash with these things and to realize I've been dealing with Tommy. I've been dealing with Betty. I've been dealing with this fire. I've been dealing with this circumstance to wake up and realize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're still mighty in God. I love before he gives us what a big job we're supposed to do. He reminds us it's still mighty. We've got mighty power. God told us we've got the power to look up at these high things and to say, I tell you what, in Jesus' name, you get down here. I'm tearing some things down in Jesus' name. You're lucky I didn't throw you to the ground. Come on, somebody. You've been dealing with your children of all the actions they've been doing, and not one time have you looked at the reason behind it. Say, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus for what you're doing in my child. I tell you, I know what Bible says when it tells him he has a plan and a future for my child, and you're not going to take it. I plead the blood of Jesus from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. It's time for us to stop saying, well, you know what, in our relationship, your feelings and my feelings and some of our feelings and our feelings together, why don't we get each other by the hand and start dealing with what's really a problem? Devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. What God has put together, let no man tear asunder. I'm telling you, it's time for the church to wake up. We are spiritual beings, and we're supposed to be dealing with spiritual problems. But we're walking around in the flesh trying to deal with problems that we've got no power to deal with. But if we'll get in the spiritual, we still have weapons that are mighty and Mighty to bring a revival. Mighty to touch a soul. Mighty to change a nation. They're still mighty in God if we'll operate in them. We're dealing with the flesh. I'm trying to appease you in the flesh. I'm trying these, these preachers to get up and make you think they're wise in the flesh. But when we operate in the flesh, we'll only be as strong as our talents and abilities will get us. And for me, it's about 10 inches. I can make it about that far, and then I'm done. But I'm thankful in the power of God that when I tap into faith, when I tap into spiritual, the Bible says if any two or three of us agree it's touching one thing, it shall be done. I might not be able to balance my own budget, Brother Donnie, but while I have faith, I can speak to a mountain and say, don't just shrink, but I want you to uproot yourself, walk yourself across this land, and go jump in the sea. That's the ability we have. If we'll just get spiritual, come on and bless the Lord in this hour. I got to go, but before I go, can I put it to you this way? Can we agree that that's power? Can we agree that we have ability? Here's the interesting thing. You ready for something the Lord gave me this week? We didn't start off that way. Read Genesis 1. Powerful. We got dominion over the animals, over the beasts. The only thing in the air are the birds. That's it. That's where our dominion stopped. That's where our power stopped. But then Satan caused man to fall. Christ said, I'd take care of it. And when he rose up, he says, but now I've given you keys to the kingdom. Before it was just on earth. My God. Before I was just to deal with the oxen. Before, I was just to deal with the lion, but he said, now I've given you the keys. to the, Whatever you bind on earth, I'm going to bind in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, I'm going to loose on heaven. I love that this scripture just tells me I have the ability to tear down high things. 
I didn't have it that way before. If that dumb old devil would have learned if he'd have left us alone a long time ago, we might still be doing something different. But aren't you glad that every time he starts to bother us, God has the ability to give me something that I didn't have before? You might be losing something now, but you're going to gain something later. Joseph lost his freedom, but he gained the palace. Peter lost his nets, but he gained a church. I just want someone to know today, it doesn't matter what you lose, God's going to give you something in return. Amen, amen. My last thing for you is this. We did our handout that one, did we? I'm pretty sure we did. Yep. Point number three. Put point number three. Notice when God intended. This is interesting. Can we look at verse 10 one more time? I know it's not on there for that one, but his intent was now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realm. It goes on to say, according to his eternal purpose. His eternal purpose. Isn't that an interesting word? Now, now put that hand, that, that, what you just put up. Eternal means before there was even a beginning, before there was an end. There was a purpose before there was ever a need. You think what you're facing just showed up and God's like, uh-uh, uh, uh. But he had a purpose even before there was an earth. Some of us don't even know what we're eating for lunch. And it is upon us. Some of us already got planned out. Bless God, I'm ordering the number one. And it's been a good week, so we're supersizing it. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good. Forget them apple slices. I want an apple pie. But some of us, we don't, it just happens that way. Can I tell you, isn't it good to know there's an eternal purpose? Before the world was formed, God knew you'd be facing what you're facing, and there was already a purpose. But the best part about it is if it's eternal, that means it shall have no end. It's eternal. Stand with us if you will.